So we're back, and this segment may seem a little out of juncture because I didn't tape the second portion of the three portions of the inflammation lecture when I was broadcasting it. So what you saw broadcasted will look different from this, and I apologize, um, but I do want to get this up and running so you can have it before next week, okay? So I believe where we left off after the first part um, the previous slide that we did was the vessels. We talked about the different vessels which contribute towards the tissues of the body, the fluids going to the tissues of the body. When we get to that microscopic aspect, we've got the capillary bed. Before the capillary bed, feeding it is those pre-arterial sphincters, um, pre-arterial um, structures. And then we've got the capillary beds and we've got the post, I'm sorry, the pre-capillary arteries in the post-capillary venules. We've talked about those. Normal exchange of gases and nutrients will be at the capillary bed. Inflammation will happen at the post-capillary venules. Okay, so we talked about all those different structures. The structure of a capillary is one cell thick, so we have easy movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide nutrients across that cell, okay? That's what we were talking about. Now we're gonna move into um, we've got pressures, but I would actually like to move to this screen first and talk about the different type of white blood cells that we'll find. <clears throat> now, white blood cells will be made in bone marrow, and different white blood cells will mature in different areas. A lot of them will mature in the bone marrow, some will mature in the thymus. We'll get into that in the future. Now, in general, when we're talking about white blood cells, there are major groupings. There are neutrophils, there are lymphocytes, there are monocytes, there are eosinophils, and there are basophils. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but I already had this up on the board, so I'd like to review it. Neutrophils fight bacteria. Lymphocytes are going to be the fighters of viruses. Monocytes, once they leave the bloodstream and move into the tissues, turn into macrophages. Eosinophils we'll see with allergies and parasitic infections. Basophils turn into what we think are mast cells. Well, we know they're mast cells. We think they come from basophils. Mast cells. Mast cells will release that histamine that we talked about earlier, okay? So these are what these different white blood cells in our bloodstream fight. And this is further on in the notes, once again. Now, if you've ever heard of a complete blood count, what they, the histologist or the cytologist, I should say, is doing is putting a drop of blood on that little slip, um, on the slide with a cover slip. They're counting the white blood cells. And within a certain range, they'll count the percentages of what they should be broken down into. Okay, so in a normal sampling of blood in somebody who is not sick, there should be approximately 70% neutrophils. Now, I broke these numbers down so they're a little easier to remember. If you look, for neutrophils, I have 70%. For lymphocytes, I have 30. Monocytes or macrophages, I have 7. Eosinophils, I have 3. Basophils, I have 7 or 1. So 70, 30, 7, 3, 1. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, okay? In a normal blood sample, these are the percentages or approximate percentages of white blood cells that we should have. If you have a spike of neutrophils, 80%, that would be indicative of a bacterial infection. A spike in lymphocytes would be viral. A spike in monocytes would be that there's some sort of generalized infection or specific infection, they were increasing the need to eat it up. Eosinophils would be seen in allergy or with the parasitic infestation. Basophils, there's some sort of reaction to a substance where we're releasing mast cells and releasing histamine. Okay, The mnemonic for this, to remember that order, is never let monkeys eat bananas. <laughs> Sorry, kind of weird, but never let monkeys eat bananas gives us a mnemonic to remember the order from the greatest to the least of white blood cells that would be a normal percentage within the blood. Okay, So never let monkeys eat bananas. 
7031. So percentages, if you're not getting this, come see me. And yes, they don't add up because I tried to create numbers that would be helpful, just easy to remember. Okay? So these are the white blood cells that we're talking about. Now backing up, let's look at, and I'll bring you out in just a second. This slide that talks about the pressures of fluids between the tissue and the blood vessels. When we're talking about pressures of fluids, we've also got to talk about the concentration of solutions. Okay? But I had a difficult time sort of, I'm actually kind of glad I'm redoing this segment. I had a difficult time explaining this in words in class, so I'd like to do a visual for you. Okay, coming back to the board. Now, we already got that picture in our head of the capillary bed, okay? And the capillary bed has the arterial feeding it, okay? I'm just going to use A to representing that. And then we've got a whole bunch of different blood vessels, capillaries, I should say, to be specific, that form the capillary bed. And then they feed into that venule on the other side. So here's our arterial, here's a capillary bed, here's the venule. Now, what we want to do is to push substances out at either the capillary bed or the venule, okay? What helps that to happen is a series of events called either hydrostatic pressures or osmotic pressures. Hydrostatic pressures is going to be the pressure of fluid. Okay, hydrostatic pressures are the pressures of fluid. Osmolarity is going to be the concentration of solutions. Okay, and, and people were getting very confused in class about this, and I sat down with a student after class and I drew it down. Maybe this will help you to understand this. Okay, in arterioles, we will have a high blood hydrostatic pressure. So the pressure within that arteriole is going to be higher than the pressure as we get to the venous end. So in the venous end, blood hydrostatic pressure will be low. A couple of things make this happen. First of all, it's simply moving further away from the heart, so there's less force behind it. But the other thing that happens is that fluid will leave the system. Let me draw fluid with blue. Okay, fluid's gonna leave the system. And as fluid leaves the system, the system, I should say the vessels, okay, I'm thinking cardiovascular system. As fluid leaves those vessels, that blood hydrostatic pressure is going to have less oomph, it's going to have less volume behind it. It will decrease, okay? Now, in addition, at the arterial side, we're going to have a higher tissue osmotic pressure. Now, osmotic pressure has the ability to draw fluid to it. And that osmotic pressure I'm going to represent with red. Okay, and what drives that osmotic pressure is if there's a higher concentration of a substance in a solution, if there's a higher concentration of a substance in a solution, it's going to draw more fluid to it. So, outside of the arterioles, we have a high tissue osmotic pressure because we've got a higher concentration of substances, and it could be all sorts of substances. It could be salts, it could be sodium, potassium, proteins, okay? And because there's a higher concentration of substances on the outside, our body is going to want to balance the solution inside the blood vessel with the solution outside. Once again, forcing fluid out, okay? And we get that flowing of fluid out into the capillary bed and out into the venous area, okay? The beginning of the venous area, okay? So that's tissue osmotic pressure. As we get further across that capillary bed and into the venules, 
the fluid has left, so relatively speaking, there's going to be a higher concentration of solute inside the blood. So as we get more towards the end of that venule, okay, fluid will start moving back into the venule, at the end of the venule. Okay? And what that does is it pushes fluid out across the capillary bed, the beginning of the venules, so it can exchange nutrients and oxygen in the capillary bed, or it can take inflammatory mediators out into that venual part if there's inflammation. And then we're going to move fluid back into the blood system on the other end. Okay. If this is blowing your gasket, don't worry about it, okay? If it makes sense to you, fabulous. What I want you to understand from this is that the beginning of this whole circuit, we're gonna force fluids out. As we get to the end of the circuit, the fluid's gonna have to move back into the blood vessels. And that's important to know because if we were to keep fluid in the tissues, it would do us no good. It would cause edema, we couldn't refresh those fluids with nutrients and oxygen, okay? So it's important to get fluid out of the capillary bed, have the exchange, and move it back in. So I know that that's, it's difficult. That's the general gist of it. I'd be happy to go over it with you again. I, I'm not, I think I have one quiz question about this, and, and, you know, other than the logistics of where fluid goes, you won't need to understand these beyond this, okay? So... Uh, and here's my little explanation. What? What is she talking about? Okay, so the last slide has a lot of fancy words, but basically what it means is that fluids from the bloodstream will be pushed out of the blood vessels into the interstitial tissue to send nutrients out and receive waste near the capillary bed. As fluid flows through the capillary bed, re-enters the venules, fluids will be pushed into the blood vessels to be sent back to the heart to get more oxygen and nutrients, okay? So, and the whole premise behind that is that we're trying to balance fluids, okay? So we don't get too much fluid out into the interstitial tissues, too much fluid into the blood vessels. Okay. Acute inflammation, immediate response to injury, what's the body trying to do? Moving fluid and cells into the tissues. A couple things. It's trying to dilute that injurious agent, that bacteria, that virus, okay? Trying to wash it out. It's moving cells into those tissues to, to try to provide an immune response, bringing neutrophils, lymphocytes to fight off any infections, okay? So transudate versus exudate. We have a normal movement of fluid out of capillary beds and into the interstitial tissues on a regular basis. And in a normal <clears throat> non-injured person, that fluid will move back into the blood vessel and move back through the circulatory system. Okay, that transient movement of fluid without an injury is called transudate. Okay, it's mostly fluid, a little bit of cells, okay, a little bit of proteins. Now, exudate is going to be an increase in fluid that also has a lot of cells, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of proteins. Exudate is going to be, I'm sorry, excuse me, seen when we either have an injury or some sort of infection that we're trying to fight off, okay? And the goal of that is to, once again, bring in white blood cells, okay, and kill those infectious agents. So transudate is going to be fluid that's moved out with a little bit of cells, a little bit of proteins. Exudate is going to be seen more in an injury process, okay? And exudate will be seen in an acute inflammation. Types of acute inflammation, I keep this zeroed in. Take a minute and read through these, and then I have a few pictures. Okay, there's serous inflammation, which is mostly clear fluid or clearish fluid. Fibrinous exudate is going to be fluid with fibrin in it that coagulates. Superative is going to have dead cells and neutrophils, usually provide a white or a green pus. Cellulitis is going to be a diffuse inflammation underlying tissues. Abscess is going to be a localized superative inflammation, okay? Cyst is going to be one that's a fluid-filled sac. Okay, hemorrhagic inflammation is when blood escapes with that exudate. Looking through these, take a minute, pause the tape, and try to decide what type of inflammation is this out of those choices, okay? 
I would absolutely go with fibrinus for this one. Okay, you can see that there's a little bit of uh, almost scar-like tissue. I believe this is part of the pericardial sac. And you can see that there's a little bit of fibrous kind of presentation. What happened is there are two layers of membranes there. They've gotten some sort of infection or an irritation. And the body's actually lied, laid down a little bit of um, fibrin, which creates fibers, which creates like a scar tissue there. Okay? And the other important thing is to ask yourself, what is this not? It's not serous. It's not superative. Okay? So what type of inflammation, if you pause the tape and look at this for a second, try to look at your list, okay? This could either be superative or an abscess. I would absolutely take either one, okay? What type of inflammation is this? This would be a generalized cellulitis, okay, in that area. And this, this did not translate super, super well. Hopefully you can see it better on your, <clears throat> on your computers. This would be serous. That's filling the pleural cavity. You can see on the left side there's a great x-ray. You can see that lung is actually probably collapsed and there's fluid filling that area. Okay. And this would be hemorrhagic. Um, from like Ebola virus was one of the examples that I found. And I copied some information about that for you as well. Okay. This would be a cyst. Um, this is an ovarian cyst. Pretty amazing how expansile that is. Okay, very good. Any questions about that, let me know. Um, cells and exudate. Okay, so Basically, I talked to you when I talked about all the different white blood cells, about the different cells that you could find in exudate. So leukocytes is a generalized term for white blood cells. Okay, leukocytes is a generalized term for white blood cells. Neutrophils are one of them that fight bacteria. Okay, lymphocytes, viral, etc. Monocytes turn into macrophages. Where monocytes turn into macrophages, let me clarify that. Monocytes are white blood cells that go through the bloodstream. When they move into the tissues is when they turn into macrophages. Okay. The way that that happens, just to have a general working knowledge of this, I mean, this is a whole science unto itself, but these white blood cells will actually move to the lining of the endothelium. And the endothelial lining is the lining of simple squamous cells that line the inside of blood vessels. Those white blood cells roll along the endothelium. They start to thin out and adhese or adhere onto that inner lining of the blood vessel. And then they send out these really cool little feelers that sneak in between blood cells and eventually they move their way out into the interstitial tissues. It's really cool. Then once one sneaks out, it'll release chemicals <coughs> that signal other white blood cells, okay? Pretty cool. And bacteria can also release those chemicals as well. Opsonas are like markers that end up on antigens in order for white blood cells to find them. It's pretty cool. Okay. C-reactive protein, you may have heard that with myocardial infarctions is one of those opsonins. Okay. And then eventually the whole goal of those is to break up that antigen. Okay, so it marks it for white blood cells to find it and breaks it apart. Okay, phagocytosis we've got on the next slide, okay? Let me know if you have any questions. I so apologize about the mix-up with not taping it. Um, things are still a little rough around the edges, but as usual, if you have any questions whatsoever, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to get back to you. Thanks, and have a great week. I am going to post a couple quizzes, so keep your eye open. Thanks.